friends. Welcome to Carlton House Terrace, home of the illustrious Royal Society, and welcome to the Summer Science, Summer Exhibition Science, Summer Online Quiz, which I might have mangled the name of slightly. My name is Steve Cross. I'll be your host for the next hour or so, bringing lots of my celebrity science friends into your homes and onto your screens to ask you questions about science. Now, I should say uh, we are almost alone here in Carlton House Terrace, what would be a hub of science excellence right now is just me and a team of extremely socially distanced and biologically prepared techs. We are fully COVID safe here at the Royal Society. I have no mask on so that those of you lip reading, I nearly said totally the wrong thing, can uh, keep an eye on me. So here are the things you need to know about the quiz before I start bringing people on screen. The first thing is the rules. Number one, there are no prizes for this quiz. If you were thinking, if I do really well in the Royal Society quiz, they'll give me a Nobel Prize, you were wrong. If you were thinking, if I do really well in the Royal Society quiz, I'll get my pick of the incredible historical collections of the Royal Society, you were wrong. If you were thinking, I'll get nothing for this quiz, you were right, there are no prizes. You could have a prize in your house, maybe the cleverest person who gets the most answers right gets made dinner by everybody else. But there are no official prizes from us. Second, there will be no quibbling with questions. The people that we've brought in to ask our science questions are all world-leading experts in their field and television presenters, nearly all of them as well. So they know their stuff. Um, if you think you know your stuff better than them, the YouTube chat thread is not the place to bring it up. Um, third, Everything I say is going to appear on screen. Everything that the question askers and answerers say will appear on screen so that you can keep up with what's going on. Every time we talk about an object or an image, it will appear on your screen. So everything you need to do the quiz is in the YouTube screen. Final rule. Do not put answers in the chat thread. In fact, behave in the chat thread. That's very important. Anyone that we think is using the chat thread inappropriately will be blocked immediately. And if you're not sure what inappropriately means, maybe stay out of the chat thread. But please definitely, definitely, definitely don't put correct answers. We currently have over 2,000 people playing this quiz. It's not a race to ruin the quiz for everybody else faster than the other teams. Stay within your homes with your answers. Don't put them in our chat thread. Now, if you want to put hilarious Hilariously wrong answers in the chat thread. We don't mind that, but keep them clean. Keep them clean. No inappropriate wrong answers. But uh, funny wrong answers we will take. So within your house, share your scores, have your fun, enjoy our quiz. Now, each of our rounds is going to be introduced by a wonderful expert who's also an incredible presenter on screen. The first of our presenters will be bringing you around for some of the younger scientists in your house. If you've got people between the ages of, say, uh, 6 and 12, they might really enjoy this round. And if you're uh, older than that, if you're an adult, maybe if you have science qualifications, if you can't get all the answers in this round, maybe you need to go back and brush up on a few little bits of your science. So our first presenter of a celebrity round will be Connie Huck. Now, Connie was the longest serving woman on the TV show Blue Peter, which people in the UK will know, uh, people from outside of the UK. It's one of our longest running children's shows, and it's really dedicated around helping children to understand the world and think about their own place in the world and how they can make the world a better place. Uh, Connie's now an author, and she's on the Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize, uh, and her book is called Cookie and the Most Annoying boy in the world. Now, when I was younger, I did actually know Connie Huck, so I'm slightly worried that the most annoying boy in the world might be based on me, but let's hope that it absolutely isn't. I'm just going to double check with our tech team that Connie is ready. I've got the thumbs up from the tech team that Connie is ready to beam into your home. So wonderful people, do you have your pens and papers ready? Some of you are very advanced. You might have a phone out. You might have a tablet out. You might be ready to Google the answers. Don't Google the answers. Don't put the correct answers in the chat thread. That's very naughty. Please, will you welcome for the very first round for our young scientists round, the incredible Connie Huck. Hello, I'm Connie Huck, author of Cookie and the Most Annoying Boy in the World, all about Cookie, who loves science and she also loves quizzes, as do I. Um, I've always been a bit sciencey and a bit quizzy. In fact, this year I was one of the adult judges on the Royal Society Young People's Book Prize. Um, so I have got some science quiz questions for you right now. Number one. What are the two gases which make up the majority of stars? 
That's which two gases make up the majority of stars? Quite a tricky one. Number two, how many eyes does a spider have? That's how many eyes does a spider have? Number three, what part of a flower produces the pollen? That's what part of a flower produces the pollen? Number four, what is the process called when plants make their own food? Number four, what's the process by which plants make their own food? Five, what do you call a group of giraffes? Is it a tower, a column or a skyscraper? That's what do you call a group of giraffes, a tower, a column or a skyscraper. And lastly, number six, what is the duck-billed platypus? Is the duck-billed platypus a mammal, a reptile or a bird? So that's what is the duck-billed platypus? Is it a mammal, a reptile or a bird? Good luck. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Connie. Now, I know that some of you at home thought Connie went a little bit quickly and I would like to see more Connie. So what we're going to do is we're going to play Connie's questions again to give you another shot at them. Can we roll Connie again, please? I have got some science quiz questions for you right now. Number one, what are the two gases which make up the majority of stars? That's which two gases make up the majority of stars. Quite a tricky one. Number two, how many eyes does a spider have? That's how many eyes does a spider have? Number three, what part of a flower produces the pollen? That's what part of a flower produces the pollen? Number four, what is the process called when plants make their own food? Number four, what's the process by which plants make their own food? Five, what do you call a group of giraffes? Is it a tower, a column or a skyscraper? That's what do you call a group of giraffes, a tower, a column or a skyscraper. And lastly, number six, what is the duck-billed platypus? Is the duck-billed platypus a mammal, a reptile or a bird? So that's what is the duck-billed platypus? Is it a mammal, a reptile or a bird? Good luck. Hello friends, welcome back. Now, while you take some time to sort out the arguments in your house about the answers to those questions, because usually I find when I host a quiz, one person in the room knows the correct answer and the other four want to overrule them. So let's just take a moment to the listen to the one clever one that you're ignoring. I just wanted to show you something funny. When I got here, the Royal Society staff asked me if I'd mind wearing summer science exhibition uniform. And I said, I'd love to wear summer science exhibition uniform. And they said, because we haven't done a summer science exhibition in person this year we've only got last year's uniform so I'd like to welcome you all to the summer science exhibition 2019 at which I am apparently staff which makes me very excited um, so we're now going to hear from Connie the answers to her questions and I've seen a few of you in the chat thread slightly confused but now is the time when uh, all of our minds will be set straight and we'll finally understand the science questions for Six to 12 year olds, let's not forget. Can we hear Connie's answers, please? So here are the answers to the questions I asked. Hydrogen and helium are the two gases that make up the majority of stars. Number two, eight. Spiders have eight eyes. How crazy is that? Number three, the stamen is the part of a flower which makes up pollen. Four, Photosynthesis is the process by which plants make their own food. Number five, you have a tower of giraffes, if you have a group of giraffes. And number six, the dark platypus is actually a mammal, but they're pretty unusual mammals in that they lay eggs rather than giving birth to live young. 
The platypus is among nature's most unlikely animals. In fact, the first scientists to examine a specimen believed they were the victims of a hoax. The animal is best described as a hodgepodge of more famous species. The duck, because they have a bill and webbed feet. The beaver, as they have a tail. And an otter, as they have body and fur. Crazy animals, the duck build platypuses. Hope you did well in the quiz and catch you next time. Bye. Thank you so much, Connie. Just before we move on to our next presenter, I mentioned that I knew Connie when I was younger and I've got one quick story to tell you. I was at university with Connie and um, I also have a much younger sister. Those are the two facts that you need for this story to make sense. And when Connie became a Blue Peter presenter, my sister was the prime Blue Peter watching age. And she asked me if I could email everybody that Connie and I were at university with to see if they knew any embarrassing stories about Connie because my sister, an innocent 11-year-old was planning to blackmail Honey Connie Huck into giving her a Blue Peter badge. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, quiz fans, that I did not email all these people asking for embarrassing details. What I did do was tell my parents just how manipulative and evil my little sister was becoming. And uh, my little sister is now a grown woman with children of her own and really doesn't like me telling that story, especially to two and a half thousand quiz fans. Our next round is going to be a round about the science of movies. And we've got the perfect host for this round. Uh, he is Adam Rutherford. He's a geneticist. Uh, he's a broadcaster. He's a TV presenter. Uh, those of you who listen to Radio 4 will have heard him on Inside Science and the Curious Cases of Rutherford and Fry. And he's also increasingly involved with the movie industry. He acts as a science expert advisor to films. So sometimes if you see a movie and it's got some genetics in it, watch those credits very closely and you might find his name. His name is Adam Rutherford. I'm going to look across to our tech team and check that we're ready with Adam's video. We are brilliant. So Adam's videos will be done slightly slightly differently from Connie. So Adam is going to give you a question, then an answer. So you're going to have to sort out the row in the house about who is right very quickly before you find out whether you've got the point or not. So with that in mind, get ready with your answers and please can we roll Adam Rutherford's video. Hi, my name is Adam Rutherford and I'm a geneticist and I'm a broadcaster and I'm also a total movie geek. I've been lucky enough to work as a scientific consultant on a number of movies over the last few years. So my Royal Society quiz questions are all about science in the movies. So here we go. Now the first couple of questions, they're picture rounds uh, and they're about Jurassic Park. So the first one is this. The first film 1993, the classic by Spielberg, Jurassic Park, we were introduced to the dinosaurs for the very first time. Shown here, clockwise from top left, the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Brachiosaurus, the Parasaurolophus, and the Velociraptor. And the question is, which one of these is the odd one out? Which one of the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the Brachiosaurus, Parasaurolophus, and the Velociraptor is the odd one out? There's a clue. The answer relates to the film's title. The answer is the Brachiosaurus, because it's the only one of these dinosaurs that was actually from the Jurassic period. The others are all from the Cretaceous period. Cretaceous Park doesn't have such a nice ring to it. Now, question two. The 2015 third sequel, Jurassic World. Now, we met some new beasts in that film, shown here clockwise from left. The Mosasaurus, the Dimorphodon, the Pterodon, and the armor-plated Ankylosaurus. Now, which one of these is the odd one out? Which one is the odd one out from the Mosasaurus, the Dimorphodon, the Pterodon, and the Ankylosaurus? And the answer is the Ankylosaurus, because that one is the only one that is an actual dinosaur. Dinosaurs were terrestrial animals by definition. Mosasaurs were in the sea and the other two were flying reptiles. Question three. Now, I am an evolutionary biologist as well as a geneticist, and I love seeing evolution in movies. 
creationists quite wrongly think that humankind and in fact all life on earth did not evolve but was created as per the first chapter of the bible the question is which science fiction classic received the following review from a creationist website quote there is little content to concern parents if you have a problem with evolution being portrayed as the origin of man simply fast forward the first 25 minutes and pick up from there you'll hardly miss a thing. The question is, which science fiction film re received this review from a creationist website? Quote, there is little content to concern parents. If you have a problem with evolution being portrayed as the origin of man, simply fast forward the first 25 minutes and pick up from there. You'll hardly miss a thing. And the answer is 2001, A Space Odyssey. Question four, in Back to the Future, the 1985 science fiction classic, Doc Brown's time machine needs a nuclear reaction to generate enough power to travel through time. The question is, exactly how much power does the DeLorean time machine need? I'll repeat, how much power does Doc Brown's DeLorean time machine need in the film Back to the Future? And the answer is, 1.21 gigawatts <laughs> and the answer is 1.21 gigawatts or as Doc Brown says 1.21 gigawatts question five which 1997 science fiction film features a character called Lilo Minai Leka Tariba Lamina Tachai Ekbat De Sibat who is also the title of the film. Which 1997 film features a character called Lilo Mini... <laughs> Edit that. Which 1997 film features a character called Lilo Minai Lekta Tariba Lamina Tachai Ekbat Disibat, who is also the title of that film? And the answer is The Fifth Element. She was indeed The Fifth Element. I'm not saying it again. Question six. My favourite portrayal of a scientist in a film is Jodie Foster's character Ellie Arroway, an astrophysicist in the 1997 film Contact. The question is, who wrote the novel on which Contact was based? I'll repeat that. Who wrote the novel on which the film Contact was based? And the answer, of course, was Carl Sagan, which probably explains why it was so damn good. And finally, here's a bonus question. I worked on a few films as a scientific consultant and sometimes the crew give you uh, gifts from the set as a, as a thank you. So my final question is about a prop from one of the greatest science fictions of all time, which I happen to help out on. And the question is this, whose skull is this? This is the actual prop from the film. Whose skull am I holding? And the answer is, this is Ava's skull. Ava from the 2015 film by Alex Garland, Ex Machina. And this is her actual skull, which you can see on the film. And I'm very proud to own it. See you later. Wow, that was wonderful. And I'd like to get all of you everywhere in the world watching this to just join me in a quick short round of applause for our subtitler. Trying to keep up with Adam during the fifth element round. Uh, the YouTube chat thread very much enjoyed that one. Now, if you've got a science fiction fan uh, in your house doing this quiz with you, I have changed my outfit specially in order on honour of Adam's round. Um, but I'm now going to do something that is going to put your science fiction fan friends slightly on edge. So I want you to watch the science fiction fan very closely as I do this. Because these go together, don't they? This, the helmet... The helmet and the shirt, they go together. They're, they're from the same thing, aren't they? They go together. Maybe if you could just calm down the science fiction fan in your house at this point, that would be quite nice. Um, 
Adam was wonderful. So you've now got yourselves a score out of 13. You had six points from Connie's round, seven points from Adam's round. So we'd love to know how you're doing in the YouTube chat thread, which some of you will see I am keeping an eye on and I am diving into here and there, mainly to say, stop putting correct answers in the chat thread. Our third round is uh, a chemistry round. It's a, an, a round about the periodic table of the elements. And it's been put together for us by Martin Polyakov. Uh, Martin is a professor of chemistry at the University of Nottingham. Uh, where he works on in creating environmentally sound materials and processes. He's also a very prolific YouTuber. So let's go now to the most wonderful room I think any of our question rounds have been uh, asked in. And let's go and hear from Martin Polyakov in Nottingham. Hello, I'm Martin Polyakov. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Nottingham. And I'm a former Foreign Secretary, Vice President of the Royal Society. Last year, my colleagues and I exhibited at the Summer Exhibition. This year, I've got a few chemistry questions for you about the periodic table. Number one, who was the Russian chemist who first propounded the periodic table in its modern form? I'll give you a hint. He had hair a bit like mine. So who was the first, who was the Russian chemist who first proposed the periodic table in its modern form? Number two. Why was last year, 2019, <coughs> A special year for the periodic table. I'll give you another hint. It was a special anniversary. So why was 2019 a special year for the periodic table? Number three. Which Italian author wrote a book called The Periodic Table? There's quite a topical hint. Part of the book was dramatised on Radio 4 on Sunday 28th of June this year. So who was the Italian author who wrote a book called The Periodic Table? Number four. I hope you're doing well. Number four. The elements of the periodic table on the table are represented by two letters, like AR for argon on my tie, or MN here for manganese. So the question is, which two letters of the alphabet do not appear on the periodic table? Perhaps you need another hint. One of them is quite an awkward letter in Scrabble. So which two letters do not appear representing elements on the periodic table? And now my last question, number five. Why has the University of Nottingham become well known in the context of the periodic table? So I'm a hint. It's something to do with me. So why has the University of Nottingham become well known in the context of the periodic table? And I'll be back soon to give you the answers. Hope you get them right. Thank you so much, Martin. Wonderful, wonderful periodic table questions there from the University of Nottingham. Now, uh, in your house, you've got, or, or in your group, or on your Zoom meeting, in your Microsoft Teams, on your WhatsApp group, you've now got a moment to sort out which answers you're going to go with for Martin's questions before I show you the official right answers. But a quick little moment 
I am currently dressed as my third favorite element. And in the YouTube chat thread, I want you to tell me which element it is. This is the only time you're allowed to write a right answer in the YouTube chat thread. So do tell me which element you think I am currently dressed as. And meanwhile, we will zoom straight back to Nottingham, fly into the most wonderful book-laden room I've ever seen, to a man whose tie some of you have already tried to buy in the YouTube chat thread. So let's zip back to Martin and let's get those answers. Hello, I'm Martin Polyakov from the University of Nottingham, chemistry professor, back to give you the chemical answers. The first question was, who was the Russian chemist who first propounded the periodic table in its modern form? And the answer is Mendeleev. You can see his picture here, and you can see that his hair is a bit like mine, or was. Not as white, but even more dramatic. Question number two was why was 2019 a special year for the periodic table? And the answer is that it was 150 years after Mendeleev's first publication of the periodic table in 1869. And in fact, it was declared the International Year of the Periodic Table as you can see from this souvenir bag. Question number three. Who was the Italian author who wrote a book called The Periodic Table? And the answer is, the author was Primo Levi. You can see, here's a copy of his book, the artist didn't really get the periodic table quite right, but it's a work of fiction, so perhaps that's okay. It's a wonderful book. I strongly recommend it. Question number four. Which two letters do not appear on the periodic table? which letters of the alphabet? And the answer is Q for Queen and J for Jack. If you've got a really old German periodic table, it might have a J on it because sometimes they represented iodine with the letter J. But all periodic tables that are printed nowadays have no Q and no J. And that brings me on to the last question. Why has the University of Nottingham become well known in the context of the periodic table? And the answer to that is that I and my colleagues have worked with a talented video maker Brady Harron to make YouTube videos called the periodic table of videos. And this is now one of the leading chemistry websites on YouTube. Brady has also worked with the Royal Society to make an excellent channel about some of the treasures of the Royal Society. He's got over 200 videos in a channel called Objectivity. So you should watch them. And of course, you should watch our videos as well. Periodic table of videos. Hope you did well on our questions. Hope you did better than on the other ones. And enjoy your science. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. Although I don't know if any of you like me were having slight flashbacks because 
I wasn't always a freelance stand-up comedian sitting in the library of uh, one of the world's great scientific institutions. I, I used to go to school, hard as it is to believe that, and I used to be really good at chemistry. Not Martin-level good, but kind of pretty good for a 13-year-old level good. And I was so good, I got into the school's chemistry competition team, and my school's chemistry competition team went to the national finals. We came all the way here to London. I'm originally from Nottingham, where Martin was broadcasting from, and we visited the, the absolutely wonderful buildings of the Royal Society of Chemistry, which, for those of you who need to know, that's one step down from the Royal Society. This is the Royal Society of all the sciences, and then below it, the slightly less important Royal Societies, called things like the Royal Society of Biology, the Royal Society of Chemistry, we went to the Royal Society of Chemistry. And my team was so good that we got to the semi-finals and then we got knocked out. And the competition was of such a high standard that the score in the semi-final was 100 to 99. Manchester Grammar School beat my school by one point. Only one person got one question wrong in the entire semi-final. Can you guess who it was, quizzes? Yes, it was me. I was so overcome with the excitement of how much I loved chemistry, I forgot what the words acid and alkaline mean and swapped them round, forgot how pH worked. And it was the lowest point of my scientific career. And I say that as somebody who now reads quizzes out online for a living rather than doing incredible research. So thank you for that little trip back into the world of chemistry. We've had three rounds now. We're halfway through the quiz. If you're a super genius, you'll now have 19 points. Six from Connie, seven from Adam, and six from Martin, because one of his questions, question four, was a two-pointer, and you get a point for each one. So you could have 19. Let us know how you're doing in the chat thread. Uh, those of you who uh, correctly identified the hat, it was copper. So congratulations if you got that one. If you didn't get that one, I'm sorry. Uh, if you really loved that one, I've got another 25 element pun questions I could do, but they're not paying me to do the questions today. So I'm going to introduce our next wonderful celebrity expert questioner instead. Her name is Maggie Adderin Pocock. She's one of the UK's great space communicators. She's a space scientist designing equipment to be used in space, and uh, she's an honorary research associate at UCL, one of uh, the UK's great universities. Since 2014, uh, she's also been one of the presenters of The Sky at Night, which is the longest running astronomy television program in the UK. So let's go to Maggie for a very special space round full of space questions about space. Have we got the message? It's space. Can we play Maggie, please? Hello, Dr. Maggie here. Welcome to the space round. Here are my questions. So the first question, how many people have landed on the moon? That's how many people have landed on the moon? Next question. What is the name of our nearest or local star? So that's what is the name of our nearest or local star? Next question. Approximately how many moons are there in the whole of the solar system? Is it A, less than 50, B, 50 to 99, C, 100 to 149, or D, 150 to 200. I'll repeat the question. Approximately how many moons are there in our solar system? Is it A, less than 50, B, 50 to 99, C, 100 to 149, or D, 150 to 200? Next question. What planet is most similar to Earth in terms of size and mass? So the question is, what planet is most similar to Earth in terms of size and mass? Next question. How many planets in the solar system have rings? Is it A, 1, B, 4, C, 7, or D, all of them? I'll repeat the question. How many planets in the solar system have rings? Is it A, 1, B, 4, C, 7, or D, 8, all of them? Next question. What is the name of the galaxy we reside in? The question is, what is the name of the galaxy that we reside in? Thank you. Answers to follow shortly. 
I think we can all agree that Maggie is winning best specially made backdrop of every questioner so far, but I also think that was a little bit quick. For some of you around the world, you haven't had enough time to shout across the room, no, 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 that's not the right answer at somebody who's being very silly. So I think we should hear Maggie Adder in Pocock's questions again. So is that, is that all right with the Royal Society team? Can we play Maggie again? That would be very nice. So the first question, how many people have landed on the moon? That's how many people have landed on the moon. Next question. What is the name of our nearest or local star? So that's what is the name of our nearest or local star? Next question. Approximately how many moons are there in the whole of the solar system? Is it A, less than 50, B, 50 to 99, C, 100 to 149, or D, 150 to 200? I'll repeat the question. Approximately how many moons are there in our solar system? Is it A, less than 50, B, 50 to 99, C, 100 to 149, or D, 150 to 200? Next question. What planet is most similar to Earth in terms of size and mass? So the question is, what planet is most similar to Earth in terms of size and mass? Next question. How many planets in the solar system have rings? Is it A, 1, B, 4, C, 7, or D, all of them? I'll repeat the question. How many planets in the solar system have rings? Is it A, 1, B, 4, C, 7, or D, 8, all of them? Next question. What is the name of the galaxy we reside in? The question is, what is the name of the galaxy that we reside in? Thank you. Answers to follow shortly. Right, you all need a moment to, uh, I think, sort out who's got the right answers in your house. So I'm gonna indulge in a little bit of stargazing, which I know is very popular with space fans. Um, I think I'm doing some things wrong. Those of you at home can probably tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong with my stargazing. That's right, the first one is, this isn't a real telescope, it's a toy telescope. It looks quite good if I use two at once. Um, the second thing is, it's daytime here in the UK. There is at least no clouds in the sky, but it is daytime. And third, I am inside. Uh, so when I say stargazing, I'm actually looking at some very blurry plastic, but a very nice ceiling here in the Royal Society. So you should have just all had enough time now to work out whose answers are going on the final bit of paper, who's are gonna count for the points, which means we can zoom back to uh, the incredible backdrop of Maggie Adrian Pocock and Maggie herself to find out the answers to our space round. So the answer to the question, how many people have landed on the moon? Well, the answer is 12. So far, 12 men have landed on the moon and no women, but we're hoping to change that soon. The next answer. What is the name of our local or nearest star? The answer is the sun. The answer to the question, approximately how many moons are there in the solar system? The answer was D, 150 to 200. Both Saturn and Jupiter have over 60 moons apiece, so they clock, clock up quite rapidly. And the answer to the next question was, uh, what planet is closest in terms of size and mass to the Earth? The answer is Venus. Venus has about 95% of the volume of the Earth and it has about 82% of the mass of the Earth. So it's definitely our sister in the solar system. The answer to the next question, how many planets have rings, is actually four. Many people are familiar with the rings of Saturn, but all the um, outer um, planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus and Neptune, all have rings, but none are quite so spectacular as Saturn's. Uh, the answer to the next question, what is the name of our local galaxy, is the Milky Way. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the quiz. Take care. So how much did you know about space, friends? How did you do? There were six points up for grabs in that round, which means absolute brain boxes will now have 25 out of 25. 
looking at the chat thread, I don't think anyone's doing quite that well, which means that the quiz is working. If you all got full marks, nobody would learn anything. And then what would be the point of tuning in? We're going to move back out of space, which is very big, and we're going to move right down, and we're going to come down here into London. And we're going to look at some of the wonderful scientific historical objects held by the Royal Society and by other wonderful institutions across uh, the city, uh, including the world-famous Natural History Museum and the wonderful Royal Institution, uh, which is, I think, if you go out of here, you turn left, you turn right. You're there, you're at the Royal Institution. Now those three organizations, so the Royal Society, the Royal Institution and the Natural History Museum have come together to put together a um, question round for you all about wonderful items from their collections and a little bit of history about the ways that they've been bringing science to the UK and to the world for, in some cases, centuries now. So we're going to go to that round and we're going to see experts from all three institutions working together to bring you this uh, set of questions about the objects that they hold in their collections. So get ready for some weird and wonderful, but make sure you've got your pens or pencils poised because you're going to have a lot of answers to write down. Can we hear from our friends across London, please? Hello everyone, I'm Christina. Hi, I'm Khalil. And we are science communicators from the Natural History Museum. We are really, really excited to be taking part in the Royal Society Summer Exhibition online, and especially in this science quiz. Now, our Natural History Museum is closed at the moment, and that means that people can enjoy our, all the specimens that we have over there. But that's why Khalil and I, we've decided to bring some of those specimens to you. But we wanted to make things a little bit more challenging and a little bit more interesting. So we've dug around in our archives and found two rather weird looking objects. And your challenge is to guess what they are. We're going to give you three options, two downright lies and one bit of the truth. And you'll have to pick which one you think is correct. Okay, I'm so excited about this, and this is one of my favourite specimens of the museum. So let's start with mine. Here is a picture of my chosen mystery specimen. And now I'm going to give you three options of what it could be. Is my specimen the jaws of the Goliath beetle? Or is my specimen the tail feathers of a bird of paradise? Or lastly, is my specimen the seed pot of the devil's claw plant? I mean, it's definitely a weird looking specimen. It's kind of hard to tell whether it's an insect, bird or plant. It could be any of them. There you go. But as I said before, it's my favorite. So I really wanted it to be up there. Should we move into yours one, Khalil? Absolutely. So, yep, here's the one I found. It's roughly conical with a little bit of unevenness as well to the surface. So what I want to know is whether it is the tooth of an extinct shark, a dinosaur's thumb, or a volcanic lava plug. Hmm, they, it looks really, really old, and they all are, aren't they? Yeah, so, you know, sharks have been around for millions and millions of years, and dinosaurs are famously old, and volcanoes are some of the oldest things on the planet, so, could be any of them. Brilliant. So that's all from us and we'll be back later with the answers. Hello, I'm Fran. I'm Dan. And we're from the Royal Institution. And here at the Royal Institution, we've been doing science for more than 220 years. And awesome stuff has happened here. Nobel Prizes have been won, elements have been discovered. But what we absolutely love to do is to talk about science and show science through demonstrations. And people can come to see scientific talks here in our famous Faraday Lecture Theatre. You can also watch these talks on our YouTube channel. And you may have even seen our world famous Christmas lectures on television. Now we have got a few questions for you. So, question one. This object here was invented by a famous scientist here at the Royal Institution, Humphrey Davy. It's credited with saving half a million lives. But where was it used? Is the answer A, on a ship, B, on a horse, C, in a hospital, or D, in a mine? So again, this object invented by Humphrey Davy, was it used A, on a ship, B, on a horse, C, in a hospital, or D, in a mine? Question two. 
which of these famous scientists did not speak here at the Royal Institution? Was it A, Marie Curie, B, Michael Faraday, C, Nikola Tesla, or D, Kathleen Lonsdale? I'll give you that again. Which of these famous scientists did not speak here at the Royal Institution? A, Marie Curie, B, Michael Faraday, C, Nikola Tesla, or D, Kathleen Lonsdale? Question three. The Royal Institution's famous Christmas lectures have been happening for almost 200 years. But which of those lecturers also invented the jet engine? Was it A, David Attenborough, B, Alice Roberts, C, Kevin Fong, or D, Frank Whittle? Once again, which famous Christmas lecturer also invented the jet engine? A, David Attenborough, B, Alice Roberts, C, Kevin Fong, or D, Frank Whittle? Hello everyone. My name is Keith Moore. I'm the head of library at the Royal Society and I have some questions for you about the history of the Summer Science Exhibition. At the end of this, will you be a past master or just history? Let's find out. Question number one. This picture was made by an automatic drawing instrument exhibited by Joseph Gould at the Summer Science Exhibition in 1894. But what was the instrument? Was it A. A spirograph? Was it B. A harmonograph? Was it C. A harmonica? Or was it D. An idophone? Question number two. William Armstrong, Lord Armstrong of Cragside, demonstrated this technique of making powder pictures using electrical discharges at the Royal Society in 1893. What made the two circular impressions in the dust? Was it A, a pair of candlesticks? Was it B, two milk bottles? Was it C, two wine glasses? Or was it D, two Whitworth made artillery shells? Question number three. Here's the physicist Charles Vernon Boys, who performed soap bubble experiments as a regular summer science exhibitor. The object you can see in his portrait at the extreme bottom right was to show colourful soap films. He displayed it at the Royal Society in 1913 and then marketed this as a children's toy. What did he call it? Was it A. The Rainbow Cup? Was it B. The Eye of Iris? Was it C. The Soap Dish? Or was it D, the boy's toy? Oh, I thought those were very difficult questions. Very difficult. And uh, I'm going to give you all a few moments to sort out your answers to those. There's a few things to remember and a few things to think about. Just before we do it, a few clarifications of issues that have come up so far through the quiz. First of all, I'm not a real police officer. Uh, this is a cheap hat you can buy from any party store. Any of you who are worried about being arrested for putting correct answers in the chat thread, you won't get arrested. You will get blocked out of the check the thread. Second of all, uh, Star Trek and Star Wars aren't the same film, uh, as all of you know. And third of all, uh, when I said the Royal Society of Chemistry and Royal Society of Biology, one below the Royal Society, I was uh, being rude and cheeky and joking about them um, because I know them quite well and I know that they would watch it and go, oh, Steve, stop it, stop it. They are, of course, wonderful organisations. Uh, I work with them all the time and uh, they are just as good as the Royal Society, if not, some would argue, better. But only some people would argue that. Not everybody. So I think that's cleared up all the things. We know this isn't a real telescope. We covered that at the time. Uh, I am, however, a real presenter. This is the real Royal Society. It's not a Zoom background. If I wobble, it doesn't cut in and out. So that should have given you long enough to sort out your answers to all of the wonderful questions that uh, the staff of the Natural History Museum, Royal Institution and Royal Society have pulled together for you. So now let's go back to them. Let's have another peek inside those incredible buildings and uh, find out the answers.
Hello everyone, this is Christina Ancaleo from the Natural History Museum. Now remember we showed you two rather strange looking specimens from our collection and asked you what you thought they were? Well, first up, here's Christina's object. Now my mystery specimen was the Devil's Claw Sick Pot. Now plants are not able to move. So they are adapted to be able to disperse the seeds as far as possible from the mother plant. This particular plant produces these weird looking seed pods with the two hooks so they can hold onto animals' legs and travel long distances like that. Now, Kaleo, should we move on to your object? Yes, well, my specimen was actually the thumb of an iguanodon, the thumb spike more specifically. Iguanodon was a herbivorous dinosaur that lived between 100 million and 65 million years ago. When the first iguanodon fossils were discovered, scientists only found one of these thumb spikes, so they thought it was a horn on iguanodon's nose. They later corrected their mistake, but you can still see the old interpretation on display in London's Crystal Palace Park. Now, these two specimens were really, really tricky, but hopefully everyone gets the right answers. Well, hopefully some of you made the mistake. We want it to be a little bit tricky as well. But thank you so much for listening. We've been Christina and Khalil from the Natural History Museum. Now, on to the next bit of the quiz. And now for the answers. In question one, we asked where this object, invented by Humphrey Davy, was used. The answer was D, in a mine. We also asked you which famous scientist did not speak here at the Royal Institution, and the answer was A. Marie Curie. In question three, we asked you which famous Christmas lecturer had also invented the jet engine. The answer was D, Frank Whittle. We hope you've liked our questions. Thank you. Bye. Now I have some answers for you. Question number one. The Spirograph was a 1960s drawing toy invented by Dennis Fisher. I'd like to see anyone draw a picture with a harmonica because that's a musical instrument. The Idaphone was exhibited at the Summer Science Exhibition, but that instrument used the human voice to create pictures, and so it wasn't automatic. The correct answer, it's B, a harmonograph. Question number two. Lord Armstrong's home at Cragside is well known for being the world's first hydroelectric powered house. No need for candlesticks there. I don't know much about high explosives, but artillery shells and high voltage electricity, probably an accident waiting to happen. Uh, Whitworth's shells were hexagonal in any case. Glass milk bottles had been invented by 1893, but they were by no means universal. No, uh, your wealthy self-made industrialist uh, probably needed a glass of wine or two at the end of the day. Uh, the correct answer, C, two wine glasses. I hope you did well. Sorry, friends. I was, I was so enjoying a discussion of the origin and treatment of noise in industrial environments in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society A, Volume 263, I think I've knocked an important wire out, uh, which means that that video is cut early. So I get to do the final answer. The final answer to this round is the Rainbow Cup. It's A. I mean, lots of you knew that. And I have another answer to all of you. Those of you asking, how does Frank open the top drawer of his unit? The door with the edge, that swings out. That's a glass filled door. It swings out so you can access all the shelves. It's actually a really clever bit of furniture. Stops dust getting into the drawers. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, there were eight points in that round, which means that theoretically you could now have 33. 33 incredible points. So do let us know how you're doing down in the chat thread. And we have one more uh, celebrity to bring to you. Now this round is very much a link to an event that the Royal Society has coming up as part of the week-long celebration of science that is the Summer Science Online Exhibition. And uh, it'll be on Friday 2 till 4 p.m. on Twitter. They'll be hosting an Ask the Space Experts, uh, where space experts is cleverly spelt with no E on experts, so it comes together to say kind of space X. It's very up to the minute. It's much cleverer than me. Um, and there'll be scientists there looking at how 
how humans could live on the moon, researchers looking at how galaxies are made, and even some who are listening out to see that whether there's any other aliens out there talking to us from other worlds. Uh, some of you are thinking there's an alien talking to you from the Royal Society right now, I know. So our final round will be a fundamental physics and cosmology round, taking you right down to the tiny, 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 but all the way out to the massive, massive, massive. Because physics is out there and it's in here. In the middle is us living, but the physics is there and it's there. And uh, the presenter of this final round is Brian Cox. Brian Cox is the Royal Society's Professor of Public Engagement. This is very much his house that I am occupying for the day. This is the room where normally he would be speaking to you on video. Uh, he teaches physics at the University of Manchester. He spends quite a lot of time underground in Switzerland, and you probably know him from numerous BBC shows, including Stargazing Live. So let's cut over to Manchester and let's have some questions from the wonderful Brian Cox. Hello, I'm Brian Cox, and the subject of my round is fundamental physics and cosmology. So here's question one. How old is the universe? Is it A, 13.8 million years old? B, 13.8 billion years old? C, 13.8 trillion years old? Or D, we don't know? So question one is, how old is the universe? Is it A, 13.8 million years old? B, 13.8 billion years old? C, 13.8 trillion years old? Or D, we don't know? Question two, how long will it take for a black hole with a mass equal to the mass of our sun take to evaporate away by emitting Hawking radiation? Is it A, a billion years? B, a billion, billion, billion years? C, a billion, 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 billion years? Or D, it'll never evaporate because it's a black hole. Question two, how long will it take for a black hole with the same mass as our sun to completely evaporate away by emitting Hawking radiation? Is it A, a billion years? B, a billion, billion, billion years? C, a billion, 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 billion years? Seven billions? Or D, it will never evaporate because it's a black hole. Question three, how will our universe end? Is it A, it will collapse into a big crunch? B, it will continue to expand forever? C, it will never end but it could be reborn into a new universe. Or D, all of the above are possible. In fact, we don't know. Question three, how will our universe end? Is it A, it will collapse into a big crunch? B, it will continue to expand forever? C, well, it will never end, but it may be reborn into a new universe? Or D, well, all of the above are possible. The real answer is that we just don't know. Question four, what happens if you fall across the event horizon into a black hole? Is it A, nothing. If the black hole is big enough, you can happily float across. B, you get completely vaporized and spread out somehow across the whole horizon. C, you get both vaporized and spread out as you fall in, and you can also fall in unaffected. And the answer depends on who's watching. Or D, we don't know. Well, those are the questions. So, uh, Good luck with the answers.
Thank you very much, Brian. And I don't know how many of the rest of you were trying to look in very closely to see if Brian had any of his own books on the bookshelves behind him. Um, those of you who were thinking, where are the questions? Um, the questions are being typed in by our subtitler, but they're also in the chat thread on YouTube. If you scroll back up, the questions are there as well, which means two people had to type in the word billion that many times uh, because Brian chose to say it. Now, we've just got a moment or two for you to sort out with your families or your friends, or it looks like in the chat thread, there is an entire accountancy firm playing this quiz. They're doing quite well. Uh, I don't know how many of them there are, might be 200 of them. Uh, that might explain why they're doing so well, or they might just be making up their score. I made up my score. I've got full marks so far. I haven't. I don't know anything about physics or astronomy. But this should have given you enough time to uh, work out whose answer you're going to put forward, uh, who has to make dinner because they said it was definitely going to be E. And let's find out from Brian what the correct answers to his questions were. So here are my answers. Question one, how old is the universe? Well, one of the answers is 13.8 billion years old. So that would be B. And that's the time that we have measured back to the time when the universe was hot and dense, which we call the Big Bang, or technically the hot Big Bang. And that's why this is perhaps a trick question, because it is possible, and we have theories that suggest this, that the universe didn't begin at the hot Big Bang, that time when the universe was very hot and dense 13.8 billion years ago. But in fact, it existed before that time. It was in a different state and it was behaving differently. So the hot Big Bang was an event in a pre-existing universe. That is possible. We don't know. And if that's true, then we don't know when or indeed even if the universe had a beginning. So you're allowed two answers. You have a 50% chance of getting it right. You could say 13.8 billion years, which is the standard answer, the time back to the Big Bang. Or you could say, and you would be correct, D, we don't know. Now the next question was how long would it take for a black hole, which is the mass of our sun, to completely evaporate away through emitting Hawking radiation named after Stephen Hawking? Well, the answer is um, roughly C. So that's a billion, 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 billion years. So that's something like one with 62, maybe 63 zeros after it. So it's certainly not a billion years, and it's certainly not a billion, billion, billion years. Um, the answer is give or take a zero or two C. Um, D is an interesting one. It'll never evaporate away because it's a black hole. That's wrong as far as we know because we're pretty sure that this process first discovered by Stephen Hawking back in the 1970s is so fundamental, even though we've never observed it, that I would say all physicists who work in this field think that there is such a thing as Hawking radiation and therefore black holes, although you might think they can't emit anything because they're black holes, do in fact have a finite, if very, very long lifetime. The next question, how will the universe end? Well, the most popular answer in modern cosmology is B, that it will continue to expand forever. Uh, we observe at the moment that space is stretching faster and faster. So we think the universe will be here forever, will be eternal in future time, and it will continue to expand forever. So that's a, an answer. However, I think <laughs> this kind of um, messes up the idea of the pub quiz in a sense. I think that actually you could have any answer for this and legitimately claim that you could get away with it. And the reason for that is that we're not entirely sure what the physics is behind the accelerating expansion of the universe that we observe. Um, we, we have a name for the thing that's causing the expansion, we call it dark energy. But we don't know precisely how that might behave on very long timescales. It could be that it changes somehow. And if it changes somehow, then it could be that it transforms into, into matter or some other kind of particle, and that would cause the universe to recollapse. It could be. So you could speculatively, although we don't think it's likely, be allowed A, 
the big crunch. Um, you could also be allowed to see there are a few physicists, um, including, including Roger Penrose, a very famous physicist and mathematician who worked with Stephen Hawking, who thinks that uh, in the far, far future, uh, by some mechanism, the universe will cycle around into a, an entirely new universe. So we, we could still be allowed a cyclical universe. So you could be allowed C. And therefore, you could be allowed D, which is all of the above are possible. We don't really know. Sorry, I, I don't need to apologize for that trick question because it actually means that everybody could legitimately claim to have got it right. And there's a lesson in there, which is that uh, very often in physics, at uh, the edge of research and the edge of knowledge, the real answer is that we don't really know. And question four, uh, what happens if you fall across the event horizon and into a black hole? Well, again, um, this, is, this is not even a trick question. Um, the, the, the real answer is we don't know. Um, this is one of the fundamental uh, and most exciting debates in modern physics. So D would be the correct answer. The other three, A, B, and C, are actually, believe it or not, all possible answers to this question. And that's why I say that D is the right answer, we don't know. Um, nothing, you can fall across the event horizon. That's the standard picture. If you just look at Einstein's theory of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, then the event horizon should not be a special place in space from the point of view of the person that's falling in. You should be able to fall in, uh, particularly if the black hole is very big, like for example, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, or the black hole that we photographed last year. If you remember that picture, it was a black hole at the center of a galaxy about 50 million light years away, which was six billion times the mass of the sun. Huge thing. Now, Einstein says, that you can fall across the event horizon, nothing would happen. However, uh, given the development stemming initially from Stephen Hawking's great discovery of Hawking radiation, then there's a great debate going on as to whether that's true or not when you add quantum mechanics in. So many physicists think that what happens is that when you approach the horizon, you in some sense get vaporized and spread out across the whole horizon. That's one possibility. Another possibility, which is called black hole complementarity, is that from your point of view, you would fall in and nothing would happen to you. But from the point of view of someone watching outside, you would get vaporized and spread out across the whole horizon. And believe it or not, people argue that that can be a consistent picture of reality, of the way our universe is. Uh, and that's why, because there's huge debate, D is probably the most accurate answer, um, which is that we don't know. Um, so uh, I don't apologize at all for some of those trick questions because I hope they provide some insight into the fascinating area of physics that is modern uh, cosmology and also the study of black holes. Wow, 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 friends. If during that you heard a uh, dripping noise from anywhere, I think that was my brain melting and falling out through my ears as I tried to understand physics. I'd like to thank Brian for a wonderful round and for making the scoring incredibly complicated for everybody now, as we're not really sure what is a right answer and what is a wrong answer. But I did ask you for hilariously wrong answers, and my favourite one so far was that the universe will end because, quote, I will eat it all unquote, uh, which I think, you know, Brian said, we just don't know. Maybe that is what will happen. The universe will be crushed down, put inside some potato, deep fried, and that will be the end of us all. So thank you so much. It's time to add up your final scores for the quiz, which will have considerable error bars following that round where we're not quite sure what's the right answer and what isn't, but you should have a score out of 37-ish. So do boast to us about how well you've done in the chat thread, or if you haven't done so well, post it in the chat thread and we'll commiserate with you. Because um, science is all about learning. If you already know everything, why would you come to a quiz like this to learn things? So congratulations to everyone who's done brilliantly and congratulations to everyone who's done badly because you at least had a fruitful hour of learning things. Those people who got everything right, they've just sat here being like, well, I already knew all this stuff, complete waste of my time. Why, they all have this voice as well, the people who've got it all correct. Um, I wanted to remind you that throughout this entire week, you can take part in Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition online activities. You can also scroll back uh, on this YouTube and see all of the wonderful videos that have happened already today. Um, 
the Royal Society would like me to remind you that lots of our presenters during this quiz have their own YouTube streams. You can go and watch all of Martin Polyakov's incredible chemistry videos, but uh, we are here at the Royal Society, so I do ask that you watch every single Royal Society video before you go and watch any by any of our other presenters, because it's very important to the Society to get their messages out. Now, today has been an incredible collaboration between lots of different bits of the society, lots of different external people. There are companies right across London working on this production, and we want to know what you thought of it. So you can give us feedback. The uh, feedback stream uh, address will appear uh, after I finish speaking so that you can tell us what you thought of this quiz, how we can improve it, make it better for future quizzes, or even just if you enjoyed it. You don't have to tell us everything that was wrong. But this has been an incredible collaboration. Uh, I'm here with members of the marketing team, with members of the public engagement team, with members of the technical team, but I just wanted to take one moment to mention somebody that isn't here with us, who would have been a big part of this production tonight, uh, the Royal Society's uh, member of staff, Dave Harrison, who unfortunately we lost earlier in the year. Uh, he's no longer with us. And um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Dave for all of the work that he did and let all of his family know that we remember Dave and we will remember Dave and we'll think of him. Thank you for joining us for the very first Royal Society Summer Science online quiz. Uh, I've been Steve Cross. Do enjoy the rest of this wonderful week of science. This year's Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition goes online, a free celebration of science from across the UK, both past and present. From July the 13th to the 17th, you'll be able to enjoy a series of, of talks and discussions, live events and interactive digital exhibits. And there'll be something for all ages to enjoy.